Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 15 of the Exodus seminar. Yesterday, we closed with Leviticus, closed with the, the end of Leviticus. And we're going to return to the very end of Leviticus, where the consequences of the covenant and the relationship to the covenant between the Israelites and God are summed up, I suppose. And what God pronounces in this section is the rewards that are attendant upon what you might regard as abiding by the dictates of ordered freedom as opposed to tyranny or the abject, chaotic freedom of the desert. So if the people, both singly and collectively, abide by the proper tenets of ordered freedom, and that would be abide by the Ten Commandments and the differentiated law, then there are a variety of rewards that are intrinsically attendant upon that. And if those principles are violated, then you could say all hell breaks loose. And so there's a real Manichaean sub-narrative of heaven and hell that makes itself manifest, but the text is more sophisticated than that because God also holds out the possibility of the re-establishment of the covenant even for those who have violated the most fundamental principles. And so you, you have a justice that emerges, which is if you abide by the appropriate principles, things go well for you and the people, and if you don't, ha, then you're in trouble. But even if you're in trouble, there's always the possibility that no matter how deep the trouble, you can reestablish that covenant. And that's exactly how it's described in the text, the reestablishment of the original covenant, and then move forward again. And this is, this is uh, one of the things we, we talked about after we were recording was the idea that this is normative. This is pr uh, descriptive rather than normative. What God is actually doing here isn't saying exactly what his will is. He's laying out the actual consequences for the way the world works. If you abide by the principle of horizontal ethic and the principle of vertical ethic, so you comport yourself properly among other human beings, and you do that in relationship to what is truly transcendent, then you'll have life more abundant. And if you don't, then everything will turn against you. Nature and society alike, your enemies will take you out and you will suffer like mad, and that just seems accurate. But then there is this admixture of the possibility that even out of error, good still can come, which I think is also commensurate with the way life works itself out, because we all know that now and then we wander off the path or fail to hit the target, and that's what sin means, and things go very badly for us, but that doesn't mean we're instantaneously doomed without the possibility of redemption. So I think it's a very it's very harsh and dramatic uh, chapter, but I think it's psychologically extraordinarily astute, and I think that in the final analysis, it actually tilts more towards an, an encompassing mercy rather than just a harsh justice. Wait, and the, so, the, the, I mean, the point of the very end, which is which is where God says that I'm not going to reject them or despise them and annihilate them, and I'm not breaking my covenant with them. Right? He said at the very beginning of the section, if you break your covenant with me, all these bad things are going to happen. But then at the end, he says. I'm still not breaking my covenant with you, which is typically not mm -hmm. the way covenants work, right? I mean, right. if you sign a contract with somebody and somebody else breaks the contract, the contract is now broken. But what God is saying is that he's, it's again, this romantic language, he's waiting for the Israelites to repent. He's waiting for us to come back to him, yeah. right? We stray, but that doesn't mean he went anywhere, right? He's, he's still there and he's just waiting for the people to, to fix it. The covenant has not been broken. It's, it's very similar to, to what God sort of does after the flood, right? He says, mm. I'm, I understand you're gonna sin again, but here's the rainbow in the sky to remind you that I'm not going to destroy humanity again. He says, all these bad things are going to happen, but you're not going to be utterly annihilated. And that part is unconditional, that the covenant is still mm -hmm. applicable. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously this was the subject for serious, you know, interfaith, you know, debate for thousands of years is whether the Jews had broken the covenant. And now that there's a new covenant and all of this. So according to the Jews, this is good proof that that's not the case, right? That the covenant was not in fact broken because it's not breakable on the side of the Jews, yeah. right? That's, that's the, the God is still there holding well, by the it's covenant. It's not obvious that within a family, a son, a father will break the covenant with his son. Like, I think generally speaking that if you're a father, 
and your son goes astray, let's say, no matter how far he goes astray, there's, there's a high probability that the door in the most fundamental sense is still open. I think that's exactly right. Well, one, one of the things that's worthy of pointing out just in terms of the, the prophecy itself, because this has been used historically by Jews to say this is one of the reasons to believe the veracity of the Bible, right? It gets all these warnings, then all these things came true. And the part that, that people tend to ignore in, in this list, and it's pointed out by uh, Abraham Isaac Kuk, who was the first chief rabbi of sort of the pre-state uh, of Israel, is that the, the part here that's, that's kind of most indicative of, of history coming true is not the part about people eating the flesh of their children. That, that's existed across societies, unfortunately, in a wide variety of tragic situations from the Great Leap Forward to, to the Holodomor in, in Ukraine. But the, the part where it says that the land, because of your breaking of the, the violation of Shemitah, of the, of the, uh, the Jubilee and, and the, the sabbatical year and all that, that it's going to lie fallow. That is where he said the proof is. Because when in human history have you ever had a land that is flowing with milk and honey and a people sin, and then the line goes, goes fallow and is, and is a complete just trash heap for 2,000 years, which is exactly what Mark Twain describes it as in, in, his, in his Innocence Abroad when he's talking about this, the, the land of Palestine in, in the 19th century. And then the Jews come back and suddenly Israel is the 15th most powerful economy on planet Earth and it's a tech center and suddenly you have big farms there and all this kind of stuff. Like it really is kind of an amazing historical, if it's not, a, if it's not destiny, then it's a hell of a coincidence. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, obviously there's very deep things for you as Jews, but there's a very simple idea here. I think that a lot of people today need to take on board that choice and freedom are conditional. And so many people have specious ideas of freedom that lead nowhere. And true freedom, the greatest enemy of freedom, is wrong freedom. Mm -hmm. And you can see that go one way, it goes well. Mm -hmm. And the judgment is not, I think a lot of people have the view that God zaps people. But actually the judgment here is the consequences of their settled mm -hmm. choices mm -hmm. and they're reaping what they sow. Well, well, one of the remarkable things about the Exodus narrative, and, and this has been very useful to me uh, in a broad conceptual manner as a consequence of walking through it, is the, is the juxtaposition of the tyranny, the Egypt, of course, which mm -hmm. no one thinks a tyranny is a good thing now. In, but people are very confused about the desert because they think that the mere absence of order constitutes freedom. And the, yeah. Bib, and the Exodus narrative is very clear, is that no, no, that the desert, which is, you're free to wander around blindly in the desert, and that is a kind of freedom. That's not obviously preferable, except as an intermediary place to the tyranny. And I really, I really think the notion of ordered freedom is, it's brilliant, especially because it does also help explain what it is that's attractive about games, because well, they're well, in order The book ends a history, authoritarianism, yeah. all order, no mm. freedom, and anarchy, mm. all freedom, no order. Right, right. In yeah, the well, the anarchists are, are the worshippers of disordered freedom. And, yeah. and, that, and, and the, I, the other thing that's interesting about that, and I guess pathological, is that, we, and the, the Exodus story does a lo lovely job of, of making this clear, too, is that disordered freedom contains within it the call the unconscious call to tyranny right. because the Israelites in their disordered freedom they want to go back to Egypt oh, or, yeah. or they want to make Moses a pharaoh yeah. or they want to erect idols they can't or, tolerate the disordered freedom or so. you want Leviathan that's Thomas Hobbes again yeah right 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 so so what, what, when you, just quickly to point out there's a wonderful so here we are in our 15th Exodus session there's a wonderful uh, a, let's say, return to the beginning. The circle comes full, uh, fully around in these, these final verses. Uh, and yet for all that, when they be in the land of their enemies, I will not cast them away. And then it re returns to, I'll make, remember the covenant because I have led them out of Egypt. But this is in a certain sense a, a, a prophecy about the return to a kind of Egypt, right? So that we, what we, we see is the, the, the being led out of the, out of the land of Egypt, <clears throat> the giving of the law, the setting up and then the losing of the law, the transgressing of the law, all these things that are here being described. But then even then at the extreme, you have the beginning point of redemption again. And so mm -hmm. I think there's a very powerful reminder here, uh, at least the claim of the text is that, and if it's descriptive, right, and not normative, the, 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 the text is claiming that no matter where you are or what you have done, there is still calling for you, waiting for yep. you, 
the possibility of some mm -hmm. it, some way back. Some it way is home. also a model of a real relationship, you know, because w when you commit to a marriage, part of the commitment, and it's a covenant, part of the commitment is, well, you're going to go astray and I'm going to go astray, like seriously astray, but the best part of both of us and the best part of our union will still be waiting for us if we can return to it, right? And that's the promise of that covenant. And that's, that's a great thing because imagine it was the case in your life that all your relationships were conditional to the point where if you made a mistake of sufficient magnitude, the relationship would just cease. It's like, well, everyone would be lost because at some point in your life, <laughs> you're going to make a mistake that big. And so, and so it's another example of how maybe the notion that the animating spirit of the patriarchal animating spirit of mankind, if, if that's a reasonable way of summing up Yahweh, at least in part in this text, the idea that that's based in this love is actually an accurate reflection of the structure of reality itself, because it is, you do get to make mistakes and still wander your way back to the right path, and, and also thank God for that. So, and, you know, they, when, when you talk about the structure of reality itself, and we talked about this in earlier episodes, but this idea that, that what the Bible is is almost the blueprint for creation. It's not as though it's, a, it's, not as though it's a post facto attempt to describe mm -hmm. creation. It's almost the blueprint that pre-exists creation yeah. in, in virtually every religious worldview. And that's why when we get to Deuteronomy, Moses calls the heaven and the earth as witnesses, right? Mm -hmm. And so the, the idea, why would God call, why would Moses call the heaven and the earth as witnesses? You can't use, you know, random objects as witnesses. The mm -hmm. idea is that reality itself is a witness to what I'm about to say to you. Yeah. Yeah. Right? The entire yeah, the earth point. is a witness yeah. to what I'm about to say to so you. Stephen's oh, brought in a very interesting point, though, the promise keeping. If you look at every system, monarchy, aristocracy, democracy, there's an ideal and then there's a corrupt. And people say, what about covenants? Well, there is a problem. The Lord keeps his word always. We don't. So you apply that to America, we the people, you think of the attack, say, on the pledge. That was incredibly important. It was misused because it was actually a disrespect of the Declaration of Independence behind it and so on. So the challenge of covenantal constitutional societies, do the people keep the promise? Mm -hmm. I just wanted to point something out in line to what you're saying, Ben, is that if we remember the image that we've been tracing from the beginning, this image of the mountain, the image of the tabernacle, this kind of layout of creation in an orderly manner with a certain hierarchy in it, you know, from your identity to the margins, to the, to the strange, uh, you know, for even the hierarchy of metals from gold to, to silver to brass, if you read the curse, it's an interesting exercise to see that what's happening is a undoing of creation. And it's completely coherent with that image. And there's a little, little poetic uh, image where he says, where God says, I will break your pride of your, the pride of your power and I will make your heaven as iron and your earth as brass. And so God is saying, I'm going to turn the world upside down. The world will be turned upside down. Mm -hmm. And then when you look at all the curse, that's what it is. Instead of moving towards a purpose, you'll be running away from nothing. You know, and you, you will be scattered out into the strangers. Instead of being gathered together in your people, you'll be scattered as strangers. You'll be, you'll be, div and then this notion of eating the flesh of your children. It's like instead of a normal causality, which moves from identity, you know, out into the world, there's going to be basically a breakdown and circular causality where you're eating, the, the, you know, your children become food for you and the world is undone in that way. You're basically, it's a form of suicide, ultimately, mm -hmm. this, this notion. And so if you read the curse, I've given a few examples, but if you read it very carefully, you'll yeah. notice that it's, it's just exactly what you said. Right, so you could what, read Genesis 1. It's an undoing of creation. So what you would saying. presume from that reading is when Nietzsche, annou Nietzsche announces the death of God, he's, he's concerned that nihilism will arise and the drive towards something like communism and the drive towards the enhancement of victimization. And his cure for that is something like, we need to formulate our own values. Yeah. But and God answers, I'll break the pride of your power. Right, exactly. And, exactly. and I'll turn the world. And now look at where we are today. The world, if any world has been upside down, it's the world in which we live today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the ultimate curse, is that it, it doesn't just fall apart. It isn't just that. No. It literally turns upside down. Yeah. And the heaven that's now iron, yeah. that's a heaven that will fall on you. Yeah. Right, yeah. right, right. So it's no, no longer light and airy, mm. that's for sure. It's the heaviest thing there is. Mm. So... All right. Any other comments yeah, on I this just, before, you, you Dennis? You had said in, in passing that 
no one wants tyranny, and I certainly know uh, the, the gist of what you're saying. And you, you had said, Oz, that, uh, that freedom is a choice, and I just want to combine them. Until the uh, worldwide lockdowns, except for Sweden, should be noted, mm -hmm. I believe that too. Mm -hmm. I no longer do. Mm -hmm. I think that a lot of people are okay with tyranny. Mm -hmm. I think they are too. They, they prefer, uh, someone says they put manacles in their hands to keep their hands from shaking. They're so afraid. Mm -hmm. Right, right. You know. Right, right. right. Well, and there's also the underground delight that you could take when you participate in the tyranny of oppressing your neighbor. And that, that, that's a pleasure not to be lightly foregone. So, all right, so let's move into numbers. I'll read, this is again from Wikipedia to cite the proper source, and I'll just go through the basic narrative structure here very quickly. The Book of Numbers is the fourth book of the Torah. It has a long and complex history, but its finally form, final form is probably due to a priestly redaction, i.e. editing, of a Yahwistic source. Those are two hypothetical sources of, the, of these ancient documents, made sometime in the early Persian period, 5th century BC. The name of the book comes from the two census taken of the Israelites. Numbers begins at Mount Sinai, where the Israelites, as we know, have received their laws and covenant from God, and God has taken up residence among them in the sanctuary. The task before them is to take possession of the promised land. The people are counted, and preparations are made for resuming their march. The Israelites begin the journey, but they murmur, which means bitch and complain uh, resentfully, at the hardships along the way and about the authority of Moses and Aaron. For these acts, God destroys approximately 15,000 of them through various means. They arrive at the borders of Canaan and send spies into the land. Upon hearing the spies' fearful report concerning the conditions in Canaan, the Israelites refuse to take possession of it. God condemns them to death in the wilderness until a new generation can grow up and carry out the task. The book ends with the new generation of Israelites in the plains of Moab, ready for the crossing of the Jordan River. So I made a few notes on numbers when I was attempting to edit it down to its narrative structure, and these are the sorts of things that it covers. It's quite interesting. It, it introduces the idea of statistics uh, as part and parcel of the polity, the counting of the Israelites. There's a sociological aspect. There's a def description of priesthood and law, sacrifice, of a foray into a definition of faithfulness and despair, uh, a story that we will spend some time on uh, describing the presence of serpents sent by God in the desert, the necessity of voluntary exposure under those conditions, and the idea of the state borders. And so it's, a, it, it's an early psychosociology numbers. That's, Can, that's a reasonable way of thinking about it. You know, it. Well, one of the things that's really interesting is, so when you read the Wikipedia description, it says that the, it's named after the census that's taken. It's the Book of Numbers. It, one of the things that's kind of fascinating is to see the contrast between the, the names of the books in English and what they actually are in Hebrew, right? They're completely different. Mm. And the Book of Exodus in Hebrew is the Book of Names. Right? Shemot means names. The Book of Genesis is in the beginning, right? Bereshit. And the, the Book of, of Leviticus which no one knows what that means, actually, Leviticus, uh, is uh, Vayikra, right, and, and he called. And, and the book of Numbers would be in the desert or in the wilderness, right? In the wilderness is a much better name for this book than Numbers. Mm -hmm. But Exodus mm -hmm. is much better than names. I'm not sure that's true. Yeah. I'll, tell you, I'll, tell you why, but I'll, I'll tell you why I don't think that's actually true. The reason I think that that's not actually true is because the process of naming is the process of specificity, mm -hmm. meaning that what you're actually right, doing is... But you is, have to know that and think it through. It, it's like right. when music needs an explanation, it's not great music. If a name needs an explanation, it's not a great name. Well, naming is and an interesting is right name if you think yeah. about it as the Adamic capacity to name, because to name is actually to subdue and categorize and to put everything in its proper place. Right, which is and really that's really the story what happens the at Mount Sinai, right? Everything is subdued at Mount Sinai. It's given its proper due. Also, the Book of Exodus, I mean, if you name it the Book of Exodus, it suggests the high point of the Book of Exodus is the Exodus, which it's not. The high point is actually the giving of the Torah. Well, the high point is not names either. No, but the, but, if, but the concept of the, of, the, of the Jewish people or the Israelite people being formed and the giving of the, the name to that people. Right. Uh, that, uh, I'll make the case that, that Bamidbar at least, right. okay, okay. The, the, yes. the numbers ought to be named in the wilderness because the stories of what happens in the wilderness that, are, are really true. a better name. That, that's and, a better and I'll name. also say that Deuteronomy, which in, in Hebrew is Devarim, which means words, right, which is 
what what Moses is giving over is a better name as well. So okay, all right, all right. Numbers one. I'll just this is just an example of of what's happening at the statistical level. And the Lord spake unto Moses in the wilderness of Sinai, in the tabernacle of the congregation, on the first day of the second month, in the second year after they were come out of the land of Egypt, saying, Take ye the sum of all the congregation of the children of Israel, after their families, by the house of their fathers, with the number of their names, every male by their poles, from twenty years old and upward, all that are able to go forth to war in Israel, thou and Aaron shall number them by their armies. And it, I guess you could also say that this is an extension of the process of naming to the process of numbers. And numbers are, they're what, are they the ultimate extension of the power of naming? It's something like that. I mean, because they're part of the process by which we categorize and make sense out of the world in an, in an abstract and semantic manner. And they're a very technical way of doing that. And so after you name things, do you get to the point where you can then number them? And that is definitely a sign of an emerging technological and conceptual sophistication. Once you can number things, you're very, very powerful. Well, you can see the transition from Exodus, which is speaking of the Jews as a full nation, to now the tribes, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You immediately go into, okay, but we're actually, so we're a nation, got it. What we actually are underneath that, the next level of, of governance is going to be the tribes. And so we're going to get a lot of emphasis in the book of Numbers on the tribes and the battles between the tribes and how the tribes interact with one another. So the subsidiarity that, that Jonathan likes to talk about is, is very much present in, in this. But we passed over when the numbers came in in Exodus, they have to pay a half shekel tax on each person, the rich and the poor are the same. And you have right through the, I mean, David takes a census and he's judged yeah. well, because he was relying on numbers, not on the Lord, I think. I don't know what you think, Dennis, but there's an ambivalence about well, numbering. There's, there's something about, so it, it, has to do with, it has to do with quantification. So it's a, there's a difference between naming and counting. In some ways, they're at two ends of a spectrum. And so it's like you, you identify something and then you, you number its quantity. And so the quantification of something in many cultures is, is some, something which is seen as quite dangerous because you're, it's like you're fixing it. You're right. saying this is how many there are. And so you're fixing something. And it, in some ways, it's like a danger. You can kill something by mm -hmm. fixing so, it. By the way, well, if you mismeasure something, you, you, you really do hurt it or a if lot. You try, a good example mm -hmm. of, of how like, we can actually experience this, it's like if you try to go into quantity and then you realize like this measures so much, Oh, really? Does it? Yeah. At what level of, well, of specificity of people are you into measuring? numbers is a really dangerous that's right. process, exactly. obviously. Well, that's right. By yeah. the way, all the way down to the point where halakhically, like in contemporary Judaism, if you're in a room with a bunch of Jews and you're trying to figure out how many Jews there are, you're not supposed to count them. You're sure. supposed to instead use the words of particular verses. I have a 10-word verse that, that I know by heart. So if you're trying to figure out if there's a minion, right, a, a prayer quorum, I actually will count by using the, the words of the, of the verse so I know how many people are actually in the room. You're not yeah. supposed to count Jews. Well, there's a actually. social uh, science. Wait, so what is the reason for that? I, I grew up with that and yeah. I never understood it. I mean, I, my, my understanding was that so there are two, right? The one is that we're not violating the promise that God made to Abraham that, that your children will be numberless like the stars or like the sands. So you don't want to falsify what God's saying, right? So that's, that's one very technical reason. The other reason is that when you reduce people to numbers mm -hmm. as opposed to names, then you get into very dangerous territory, yeah. that the person yeah. who's standing in front of you is not just a numbered Jew, that person is a person with you, a name, you and that's be, the way that you actually ought to treat other human beings. You could be reducing the complexity to the wrong specificity. Exactly. So there's a doctrine in social science, which is beware of imposing a measurement system on a complex system because the system will warp itself to the maximize ego. the measurement system. Exactly. Oh, that's right? the so right way you, to see it. If you abstract yeah, out the wrong right unity, yeah. which is what you're doing when you're counting, you'll tilt the whole system Which is towards why when they do the census, that's why they use the shekel. They're not actually counting the Jews, they're counting the shekelim. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right, yeah. it's also why you don't use a full shekel, you use a half shekel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's so incredible that the Holocaust, of course, numbered everybody yeah. on their wrist. Like, it's just mm -hmm. so, it's right. so amazing. Right. Yeah. yeah, well, and everyone feels that, that, that no, no one really wants to be reduced to, to a, a number. To a number. Yeah. We don't mind being reduced There's to so a name, right? And, oh, but for that to reduced to a we're number. Probably, yeah, yeah, we've definitely. almost reduced ethics. To mm -hmm. numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, yeah, you yeah well, the see. utilitarians tend to do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, but there, you can see it. Like, actually, what we went through with COVID and Vax Pass, especially in Canada, is exactly an example of an excess of counting, like an excess of wanting to control things in their detail and to contain them in, 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 in number. So it's like, 
I, I can, by counting, the authority can account for everything. And therefore, it's also a, a method of control, right? To count everything. Mm -hmm. And so there's something about that. Like there are many images, even in Revelation, people struggle to understand this image of the number of the beast, but it has to do with this problem of like an excess of counting, you could say. Where it's like so trying to get perfection right? in quantity rather than perfection in quality. And that, that's, mm -hmm. that was the function of censuses in the ancient world, as I understand it. It was to measure military strength, military might, mm -hmm. or it was a mechanism that empires used to uh, exact tribute and to measure tribute. Right. So it's the reduction, right. of, reduction of the person. To, What's kind to of fascinating is, is we'll see you talked about the, the establishment of borders for the various tribes when they, when they get to the, the land of Canaan. And, uh, and the borders are not drawn based on the size of the population. Uh, so it's, these are just the, the borders that God establishes, but there's no correlation between the size of the population and the actual amount of land that's given to each tribe. I mean, some, Le Levi receives no land, right? I mean, the, so the, the, that idea that it's not about, you know, how many numbers you have. Greater numbers are not necessarily greater merit. Mm -hmm. um, it's, mm -hmm. that, that's, it's like that's the a, U.S. Senate. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. So, so well, we've, we've walked through some of the pros and cons of an emerging statistics and sociology. Mm. We'll move to numbers 10. Uh, I termed it moving out. And it came to pass... Now, remember what happens here is the Israelites rest when the cloud that's guiding them rests, and then when the cloud decides to go whether it, where it will, then the Israelites are bound to follow. And I, we, we talked about that a little bit in relationship to the idea that there is a time to rest and there's a time to move, and that you do move. People, modern people don't really understand this. You do move where the Spirit takes you, and you, you, do, that, you do that more or less automatically because your interest will grip you and it will move you in a direction. And you could say, well, that interest is just you, the manner in which interest manifests itself, but you, you, you only have to think for a moment to understand that that's not true, because one of the things that's very difficult for human beings to do is to make themselves interested in something they're not interested in. Whereas if you are interested in something, you'll follow that with no problem and happily. And so there's an autonomy of the spirit, that's exactly it, there's an autonomy of the spirit that moves you and perhaps an autonomy of the spirit that, that compels rest as well. In any case, the cloud stays in one place and so do the Israelites, or it decides it's time for us to continue our journey to the promised land, which is also what we're always doing because we're always walking uphill. We're always moving to a destiny that's hypothetically better because otherwise we wouldn't be motivated. And that's part of the basic narrative of, of the entire Exodus story. And it came to pass on the 20th day and it's part of the adventure of life, that impulse to move forward. And it came to pass on the 20th day of the second month in the second year that the cloud was taken up from off the tabernacle of the testimony. And the children of Israel took their journeys out of the wilderness of Sinai, and the cloud rested in the wilderness of Paran. And they first took their journey according to the commandment of the Lord by the hand of Moses. So, and then I'll move to 14 to 27, unless anybody has any comments on that, the idea that the cloud's moving. Um, then the next section of numbers we'll, we'll touch on is 14 to 27. The ben? only intervening comments I'd make yep. here is that for a couple of chapters, and this, you're gonna need this for later, um, the Jews bitch a lot, like a lot, right? <laughs> like they complain about there's, there's lack of meat, why is there no meat? And Moses gets very angry at them and, God's, and God gives them the meat. And so this sets the, 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 the sort of you think the covenant has been reformed, but it doesn't stop the complaints, and the complaints are going to lead up to, you know, mm -hmm. the, the later Moses striking the rock. But you have mm -hmm. to have that, that knowledge that the Jews just keep complaining about things, and Moses keeps getting angry at them, and, and God keeps getting angry at them in, in kind of varying degrees. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and so, you know, the, the wilderness is a pretty draining place, and, and the, the, heights of, the heights of revelation are not enough to take you out of the depression that you sink into mm -hmm. when you're actually in a wilderness, and it's important, mm -hmm. I think, to recognize that. And it's that. difficult to maintain integrity of community when people are wandering, when people aren't are only voyaging to the promised land and everyone wonders if there's a better path or even if they're going in the right place. And so that would be an echo of the idea that even if a people are united or even if you're united within yourself, there are going to be doubts that are emerging constantly that have to be managed. I mean, one of the things that happens to people when they collapse into depression and anxiety is that the internal murmurings get so prevalent and loud that they destroy not only 
the covenant, but the possibility of any covenant whatsoever. That would be cataclysmic de depression. It's, it's, the, it's the consequence of being completely overwhelmed by anxiety, which is pathlessness and pain, such that no forward movement whatsoever is possible. And, and that is definitely a continual existential risk, right? Because are we on the right path? Who knows? Are we with the right people? Who knows? And you have to, you have to wonder, because that's part of imagination, but if the doubt arises to too great a degree, then it, 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 yeah, it expands until it destroys even its own purpose. And it's a very difficult thing for, for leaders to manage or for us but, to manage within there, ourselves. There's clearly a parallelism between these passages and the early passages of Exodus. So the Israelites are sort of, they're in a state of panic. They're worrying about the battles ahead. They're worrying about the, the journey ahead. Um, they're also, I think there's, there's all the sort of, the complaint about the water, the manna and the quail. We're invited mm -hmm. to sort of see this, this parallel. But I think at the same time, there's a, there's a key difference. And that is that the, the character of Moses, we start to see the kind of the faltering of, of the leader. Exactly. Uh, uh, and that, that's a sort of the key change. And early on, you've got, in the early part of Exodus, you've got Moses as the, you know, the great leader, the prophetic leader, and here we're starting to see the, the weakening. I think, that once it, I think that goes back to once he identifies with the people, he expects more of the people. It's like before, they're complaining about the water, and he's like, okay, there's no water, let's try and solve this problem. Okay, they're complaining about the, man, the, 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 the manna. Uh, what are we supposed to do about that? Okay, well, I'll ask God, and there'll be manna that falls from heaven. Here you can see, I mean, it, it literally says, and then the power, he despairs. I mean, he goes to God and he says, what is wrong with these people? Why did you give me this job? This is the worst job in, in human history. What is, what is happening here? And you can see that, that that's all leading up to it, all of this can last so long as there's the common vision that everybody's going to go into the land. Mm. And when that right. falters, things start to well, fall that's, apart okay, extremely okay, well, fast. So, so that's, that's so interesting because we should, we should recollect for a moment where we are here in the narrative progression. So just take stock of that again. So we're out of the tyranny. We're, we're through the desert in a way because the law has been revealed in commandment form and it's been differentiated and the the rituals of sacrifice and subsidiarity have been laid out and Israel is a, is a people sort of twice over. There was the covenant and then the broken covenant and then the reestablishment of the covenant and the narrative insistence is we are fractious and useless as we are. We're, we are in fact united as a people and even united under the appropriate principles and we all agree on that. We're in, in it with voluntary assent but we're still in the desert moving towards the promised land, right? And so just because we're united as a people doesn't mean our problems are over. Yeah, and you, and you so, can and see then, it as, as uh, the mountain is a great, great idea. Imagine the mountain and at the, really at the bottom, bottom of the mountain is the promised land. So the revelation comes from above and it has to settle. It has to settle in the tabernacle. It has to settle in the people and then ultimately has to settle in the land. And that's like the image of, and until then, like you said, it's still not well, finished. And ben, you, the story's you, not finished. You, you pointed to something extremely important here is that, okay, so now you're united as a people and you're united under the covenant. That's all pretty good, but you're still in the desert and that's a problem and everyone's complaining. Then you might say, well, what, what gives you unity even then? And this is what's so remarkable, I think, is that that is something like a shared vision of the future. And so we, we talked earlier about the idea that without vision, the people perish. And we talked a little bit about how that's literally the case, is that it is shared faith in a vision of the potential future that actually unite people in relationship to, hard, into, in relationship to hardship. And when, that, when faith in that vision of the future falters, then, well, then everything that, is, that, that, is, that, that's is... That's another key, key contrast. So early on, you've got, you know, the Israelites are, are, are trying to escape. Right, they're, they're trying to get you know freedom, freedom from, as Isaiah Berlin put, puts it. Now, it's kind of freedom to. Mm -hmm. They've got to form the vision, and it's very often the case, I think, that you know leaders who are brilliant, for example, in wartime, or, mm -hmm. or brilliant in kind of in, in sort of mm -hmm. civil rights uh, campaigns, or as opposition critics, are, are actually <laughs> are actually the worst when it comes to as it were, starting and constructing a vision once the, once the war right. has been won. Well, I think that right. one of the things that's fascinating here is there's a big fight. In chapter 11, big fight between Moses and God. Right? For, the first time they, for the first time really since the burning bush almost, they have this giant fight. Mm. And there's a, a big fight where, where Moses 
says to God, these people are they're, they're garbage. What are, you, what are you doing? Why are you why are you making me be with these people? And God's immediate response to them is, is he says, OK, well, then I'm going to need you to devolve authority. He says, I, want, I need you to bring me seven of the elders, and, I need going, and they are going to come to the tent of meeting. I'm going to speak to all of them, and I'm going to start to devolve authority away from you. And Moses is saying, well, but that's not, why are you punishing? Like, punish the people. The people are the ones who are, who are bitching and moaning here. What, what exactly is, why, why is this because of me? And so he, he's really angry at the people, Moses, at this point, right? He's saying, why are you even bothering to feed them? Like, they're asking for the meat. Why are you bothering to feed them? And God takes that as like, well, you're, you're saying I can't do it. And, but that's not really what Moses is asking. That's not really what God is answering. What Moses is saying is, why should they be fed? Why are you, why are you giving in to these people? They should, they should know better than this already. We've been through this already. And God is more, more merciful to, to them than, than Moses is. And also, he has more justice for them than Moses does. So because God's still not Moses, it, but, but right? Is that, is that also an attempt by God to rectify their inadequacy? Because one of the ways that perhaps you rectify someone's faithless inadequacy is by actually giving them, paradoxically enough, by insisting that they take more responsibility. Well, well right, right. so the way God answers this question is he says, okay, I'm going to give you meat, you, you get what you want, but you get so much that it's, it's going to kill you, right? I mean, it says that God strikes them with a the plague and the meat is still in their teeth right after that. Uh, the idea being that he's going to punish them kind of according to, to what they wanted here. And he's saying to Moses, I had this the whole time. Like, you you're seem to be doubting me, but I knew what these people were. You think I don't know what these people, of course I know what these people are, and that's why I gave you the job. And so God's kind of upset with Moses, saying, well, I knew what they were, I know who you are, I know that you're, you're capable of doing the job, so what are you getting so what are you getting so upset about? Like, you should really understand your job. You can start to see all the fractures are beginning to emerge, and within a couple of chapters here, everything is going to start to just blow apart. I think there's a great overriding lesson, at least as I've studied numbers all of my life. First of all, on numbers, when people ask, what does it refer to, numbers? I go, numbers of complaints. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that helps that part. What really ticks God off, and I, I, it's another reason I just love the Torah because it's so real, what really ticks God off is complaining. And I think that's... And is that, is that like resentful complaining? Bitter, resentful, underground complaining? Uh, the, uh, the key word for me is that it betokens ingratitude. Right, right, right. God hates ingratitude. Mm -hmm. I'm not God, but I hate ingratitude too. Mm -hmm. I am convinced it is perhaps one of the key aspects of a bad human being. It, it, do you think that... I'd, I'd like everybody's opinion about this. I mean, I noticed in my clinical practice that there was almost nothing worse for someone than resentment. Now, it was educational because I learned that there were two interpretations for resentment. One was some, you're being oppressed either by yourself or by someone else and you need to stand up for yourself. And so the fact that you're resentful means you're allowing yourself to be tyrannized over. That's one possibility. So then you should integrate your aggression and learn to stand up for yourself. That's, uh, uh, that's, that's a form of assertiveness training, a very common therapeutic practice. But the other was, you're just immature. You know, you're not willing to take on the responsibility. And you have to sort that out. If you're resentful, maybe you're being oppressed and you should do something about it, but maybe you're just immature. So it was very educational. But the problem with resentment was that it, it really embittered people and it also justified the use of vengefulness against other people. Mm -hmm. And so it really it, well, hurt them. Now, do you think that the, the question here is, is gratitude the opposite of resentment? And if you practice being grateful, is, is part of the reason you're doing that is to, is to learn to master. You have reason to be resentful, right? Because life is hard. And, and you can't get rid of the difficulty of life and the suffering. But you could practice being grateful. I just want to say on this that gratitude is the mother of goodness and happiness. Ingratitude is the mother of evil and unhappiness. There is no ungrateful person who is happy or good. And why and, did you settle on, why did you personally say settle on the issue of gratitude per se? Because it, that parallel is interesting, seeing that yeah, I also parallel, saw resentment is yeah, so terrible okay, so for you're, people. You, they're, they're very related, but for most people, I think, or at least for the lay person, gratitude is, is it's just very understandable. Either you're grateful or you're not grateful. 
what we what we are experiencing, in, in my view, at this time uh, in in America, is the cultivation of ingratitude. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. And that, I agree. I, I, as I say often, you get a BA in, in ingratitude, you get a master's in ingratitude, mm -hmm. and a PhD in ingratitude, and, and a professorship and, too. So Dennis, the, phrase, Dennis, <laughs> the, the right. phrase that the phrase that you just used, the cultivation of ingratitude, this ties in so beautifully with the text in in chapter eleven, specifically because. The, the, what is it that the Jews do differently this time than before, right? When they're asking for water, when they're asking for food. Before, it was like, okay, they're actually thirsty. Okay, they're actually hungry, right? The language in the Bible here is really fascinating. So it, it says in chapter 11, verse 4, it says, The rabble in their midst began to have strong cravings. Okay, now the actual Hebrew is that they began to hit avu ta'ava, right? It's a doubling of, of the, doubling of the word. Whenever that happens, that's an intensification in Hebrew. So the basic idea is they are cultivating a craving, mm. right? It's the craving that's mm. to blame. They're not saying we want meat because we're hungry for meat. Yeah. They're saying we are going to cultivate ingratitude. We're going to cultivate a craving, right? Mm. And, and so that's what makes it's Moses so angry. kind of so a consumerism. Angry. Exactly. And, 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 and you actually have to cultivate in your own mind a feeling that you have a lack of something, which is basically, I mean, human beings have a tendency to do this, right? We, culti we cultivate a craving for the taboo. And so as we stretch the boundaries of society, we look for new taboos to violate in order so that we can have a craving for that. Um, and, and so that's what Moses is responding to. He's saying, what you're actually requesting is not something that you want. It's something that you've cultivated a craving for, which is why after the plague breaks out, this place is literally so, named so Kibrod Hatava. So it's called the Graves of the too, Craving. That the... That the the suffering of the people isn't true suffering. That's the point you're exactly. making, is that it's cultivated yeah. suffering. This, this is right. And cultivated, this cultivated is what really, resentful suffering. Right. And this is, this is where Moses really begins to turn on the people in a dramatic way. He, because before it was like, okay, I get it. You were slaves in Egypt. Yeah. You have no sense of what it is to be a civil society. You have no sense of what it is to be a good person. And I even, I, you know, I'm even willing to stand up for you to the point where when you commit an act of idolatry directly after Revelation, I'll stand with you because I understand who you are. What he doesn't understand and where Moses cannot deal with it is you guys okay, so went out of your way to cultivate a thing that you didn't have just so that you could want the thing and then claim that you wanted to go back to Egypt for the thing. Well, that's a kind of that's a kind of claiming the virtues of victimization. And so so is what's is what happened is what's happening here is something like this. So we we've, we've already established that the Israelites have now established a state and it's kind of functional and that means if it's if it's a functional state your basic suffering has already been mitigated. And so then you might say one of the temptations of people in a functional state after their basic sufferings have been mitigated is to cultivate oh, yeah. the suffering for the point of victimization and the moral demand that yeah. that victimization... Or just, or, or just also the problem of satiety. And I don't know you said that in English, yeah. but, yeah. but the idea, the, the problem of desire itself in, in, the, in the, the, the King James Version, it says a lust, like among them fell right. a lusting. Mm -hmm. And uh -huh. so it's this sense that, you know, you, you just... For your own sake, you know, you want to eat that snack food, you want that, that uh, extra it's thing. A you, yeah, it's a cultivation of craving. It's a cultivation of craving. Right. Medieval Christian mystic, Meister Eckhart, is, or Eckhart, was reputed to have said, I don't think you can find the exact quotation, but he's reputed to have said, if you have one prayer, then that should be gratitude. Mm -hmm, right. Which right. Is, I think, right. Uh, By the way, this is also the gap between yeah, and that it, the, the reason it's discussion. a virtue is because it's something you should practice. Like we should, we should note this. It's like, it's not that easy to be grateful because life does involve pain and suffering. And so you, you can justify, it's easy to rationally justify resentment. It, it truly is, but it, it's extremely toxic and it's, it's tied up in a strange way with deceit and arrogance too, which is something I won't get into. But the, there is a lost notion, I would say, in our culture that we've lost the notion that virtue is something to cultivate. Like gratitude and courage are both difficult. There's all sorts of reasons to be timid and ungrateful. And it's to, it's to, it's to work against the evidence in some way that constitutes the core of the virtue. And so you might, I've talked to my wife about this a lot. She's been very much trying to cultivate a sense of gratitude. And it's a practice that she's engaging in to try to observe in every, every situation what miraculous gift she's been given within the context of that situation. Of course, sometimes that's extraordinarily difficult if the situation is dire, but you, you could ask yourself, you could abstract away from that and say, well, even if the situation is dire, is it so self-evident that the best stance to prepare yourself still wouldn't be one of gratitude? 
And it seems to me that that's a, that's a very hard argument to shake. W.A. Jordan, one of his them. last lines of a poem, let all your thinks be thanks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but in the Torah, isn't it right that you've got a trio? You've got gratitude, memory, remembering, and history. Again and again, they're told, remember, remember, remember. It's when we forget we're ungrateful. And the Jewish festivals are not festivals of nature, like the Canaanites. They're festivals of history. God did this for you then. Mm -hmm. Is that part of, you, you suppose that remembering is associated uh, thematically with the notion of honoring your mother and your father? Because to remember, to remember Absolutely. is to remember the traditions Where you of came the past. From. Well, mm -hmm. yeah. What and you one, owe. One you of know. the things that's really struck me about our modern culture, especially the culture that we pass on to young people, is that we don't stress the necessity of gratitude. We view the we, we, we view the we view the past as well a patriarchal tyranny, let's say, and and there are elements of the past that are both patriarchal and tyrannical. But my sense always is well. Yeah, but if you plug in your toaster in the wall, it works. And when you go outside, so the, yeah, pagans, you have to, the houses aren't burning down and in there aren't to, riots everywhere. In order so to, if in the order pagans to depended craving, on nature, we depend on technology. In, in order to cultivate a craving, the, the, the Bible seems to be pointing out, in order to really truly cultivate a craving, you have to rewrite history. Because, and, and so that's actually what happens here. It says that they start to cultivate a craving for That's what's happening here. That's yeah. what I'm saying. So yeah. is it because okay, what the text okay. actually says, right? No, immediately I mean after here that. in America. Oh, yeah, right, okay. right, so, right. Yeah, yeah. So, in, so the text, right, exactly. So the, the text says that right after the people begin to cultivate a craving, listen to the way that the, the, the Bible characterizes the Israelite complaint, right? They say, who will give us meat to eat? We remember the fish we ate in Egypt at no cost. And uh, they were mm. slaves. But the way they remember right, that is right, right. it didn't cost us anything because we didn't have to buy it. Right? Right. We didn't well, have the to... same thing happened with post-Soviet nostalgia. That's yeah. right. Exactly. Remember the good old days yeah. under Stalin. It's the, like the part of this Stalin to is me positively that's... regarded by a majority of Russians yeah. to this day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For me, what's interesting is that the ingratitude leads immediately to regression. And there's the Jungian term I always forget, which I ask you, that's regression to a prior archetype. What's mm -hmm. that name when you... Oh, oh yes, I'll, I'll remember okay. that in a moment. Yeah, Retrogressive but, restoration of the persona. Right, it's, like, it's basically yeah. like midlife crisis mm -hmm. in a way. It's like you're, you're out, you're in this time of change, you're getting close to something, right? And you're out of, like, let's, I, I think of this image a lot in terms of like you're a hermit crab on the bottom of the ocean and you've scuttled, you've outgrown your shell, right? And you're scuttling out but you're naked and you're vulnerable and predators swirl everywhere. And you don't even know if there's another shell that's out there that you can fill. It's very much the state right now of the, of the Israelites. Mm -hmm. And you have to have faith to keep going that not only will you find something out there, but that it will be more capacious, that you can fill it in a greater way. And so many people seek to kind of scuttle back to the thing that they ill fit mm -hmm. before mm -hmm. and kind of cram themselves well, back into something. Well, that was a pre-existent state of order. Mm -hmm. Right, so right. there is a validity. There is a validity in nostalgia for the past, and the validity is, well, we weren't dying then, and that's the truth. And so, but it's not a but that's fit not that you can wear again. It's like, right. That's it's like, that's the it's, danger. It's the, it's the siren song of a midlife yeah. crisis. Yeah. Let's say, mm -hmm. if I just go back and do that this over again, that would be the again, pathology of an yeah. unthinking conservatism. Mm. Right, but that, they're misremembering. That worship of the past. Yeah, they're misremembering. That's the point. Mm -hmm. It's not just oh, we survived, or at least we were alive back then. It was like we had all this extraordinary food, and I think in, I think a little bit later they actually describe this kind of a shocking verse to me: Egypt as the land of milk and honey, flowing right. with milk right. and honey. Yeah. I think that's right, isn't it? It's just yeah. this extraordinary right. kind. Of, it's not right. just forgetfulness. So or, now it's, or, the, or misremembering. it's the projection of the uh, destination into exactly, the past. Then. Exactly, the, the destination they're journeying to, as it were, is just is, is just Maybe. flipped around as if they're heading back. Yeah. So now the Israelites have a state, and now they're tempted by ingratitude, and the ingratitude makes them murmur, and the murmuring is in a sense, calling forth another tyrant. And that's, that's what Moses is objecting to. He's saying, now the burden is too great on me again. Mm. And God returns to this notion of subsidiary responsibility once yeah. again, right? So to even address this issue of emergent lustful ingratitude, it's the same remedy. I just want to point out one thing, I, just, 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 just for an image and people to understand the relationship of this, I keep pointing to this fractal structure because I want people to realize the Bible is so coherent. It's crazy. You know, this idea of they want to eat flesh, that they want to eat animals. And in the hier hierarchy of things, you know, the animals are on the outside. The animals are that which is being sacrificed. They're 
they're, they're on the edge. Uh, and so God burns the edge of the camp. It's almost like, you know, that's what they want. And that's where the fire comes. It comes from to the edge of the camp, kind of singes the edge. And so there's that, because you'll see later the, an image of the Miriam who is too pure. But here you have this sense in which what they want is the animality. Like they want to dive into the flesh. And the result of that is this, it's like, it, and the, but the result is something like cutting off some part of the edge, a kind of circumcision, mm. you could say, like cutting off the, the flesh. And Jordan, in, in accordance with what you're saying, which is this, this kind of attempt to, the, the, the desire for a tyrant that they want that's borne out by this, look at the language that's used where the people are, right? So the, it says, Moses heard the people weeping, clan by clan, each one in his tent's opening. The last time you saw that language is when Moses was in the tent of meeting by himself, right before the reestablishment of the tabernacle. He's out there, they're each at their tent's opening, and they're looking this way. To, to, so they're, they're, they're treating Moses like, you're the tyrant, give us what we want, right? We want the person who can provide us the meat. And Moses mm-hmm. is saying, I don't want this. Why are you and giving this to me? It's too much and for it's him. It's too much for me, I can't do again. this. Mm-hmm. And God says, okay, fine. So then the answer is that I'm gonna take some of your, I mean, it's tr- again, more tragedy for Moses. The glory that I've put upon you that comes from my relationship with you, I'm now going to spread to these 70 elders who are going to help you carry, carry the burden. And it, it kind of gets worse from here, actually. And the image, what's interesting is what the image ends up being is something that God promised in the, in the curse, which is that you will eat and you will not be satisfied. And so then it's almost, God is, 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 going, to, is going to say, oh, you want meat? Oh, you're going to have so much meat that you're going to, it's going to, it's going to make, you're going to be disgusted of it. Like you're going to loathe it at, by, the, by the amount of meat that you're going to have. Which, by the way, is actually pretty good therapy. Like, if you, want, if you ever have a kid who really... Has a craving? <laughs> has a craving, you just, like... Uh, I have a friend, a family friend, yeah, exactly, who did it's this with cigarettes, cigarette found, found their kid smoking, mm-hmm. and was like, okay, here's an entire pack. You're going to smoke this entire pack right now. A kid never smoked again. <laughs> right. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, do you, want me to, do you want to continue from vo- v- verse 18, or do you want me to go? Um, well, we, we were going to move from verse 14 to 27, unless there's something now else that... That is packed back in, in chapter 10 that you're in. Oh, Okay. Okay, well, so, I'll return to that for now, and, yeah, and then yeah, you we'll, want to we'll to pick that, it up. Right, yeah, right. so this is just more of this subsidiary organization, uh, just the narrative part of that that Ben commented on, the differentiation of the social order right to the tribal level, 14 to 27 in Numbers. In, in the first place went the standard of the camp of the children of Judah, according to their armies, and over his host was Nashon, the son of Amminadab. Thus, so then, you, then after that, because you're now you're going to skip to 28, but then after that you have all the tribes described with their standards. Basically, they're right. walking ahead, like in order, depending on their different identities. Right, right. And so, and so what we have here, uh, to point out why this is relevant, is that the Israelites are on the move again, but there's a hierarchical structure to their movement as well, to their movement forward. And that's in keeping with their tribal allegiance. That's right. Yeah. Right, and that's part of a subsidiary structure. So when you're moving forward, obviously, when you have a an organization, when you have a staff, which is an interesting term because it, it's the same idea as the staff of Moses, you differentiate your staff hierarchically and then you move forward with your staff, like in a business organization, you move forward with your staff towards the desired end in a hierarchical manner. It's like a phalanx. By the way, it's, it's fascinating that the tribe of Judah comes first, so obviously that's going to that's an echo down in history to the, it's the tribe of Judah that's going to take the kingship eventually under, under King David. And then in Christian theology, obviously, it has tremendous implications as well. Uh, the, the kind of great, st- the, and the first person who's carrying it is this guy, Nachshon ben Amidadav, right? So the, the story in the, in the, that harkens back to Exodus. There's this very famous Midrash, which is sort of a, a commentary, kind of, on, on, the, on the Bible. And the story of Nachshon ben Amminadab is that Nachshon is the person who at the splitting of the Red Sea, when, if you recall, God is, it says to the people, go forward, and, Mo, and they're like, what are you talking about? And Moses starts praying, God says, no, you have to go forward. So the legend is that Nachshon ben Amminadab, this specific guy, is the guy who walked into the water up until it reached above his nose, and at that point, God split the sea. So he was the natural leader there. Yes. You know, that, that, that's even, this is a little biological interlude. I was talking to Temple Grandin, who knows more about herd animals than anyone else in the world. You know that cows have natural leaders and that cowboys who know their herds, they move the leader and all the cows follow. And then, you know, if you take your cows on a long trip, imagine you numbered them in sequence when they pass through a chute and they just do that of their own accord. Then you take them like on a three month trek and you run them through the chute again, they'll, they'll run through the chute in the same order. Mm. So there's a natural hierarchy of leadership and that the, the cows who are leaders have 
Now, I don't remember what the set of distinct physiological characteristics are, but they have a set of distinct physiological characteristics. And all the cows know who the leader charisma, is. Usually. Yeah, charisma. Yeah, charisma. <laughs> that's right. But, their, their face shines. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I want to yeah, yeah. just point out something that, it, I mean, maybe it's been obvious since the beginning, but this is maybe a place to point it out, is that Israel is not just one thing. Mm -hmm. Israel is already a multiplicity inside a unity. So the way that God conceives Israel is that there, it, it has already that fractal structure. And so mm -hmm. if you think of, you know, from the time of Napoleon up to the Chinese totalitarianism, mm -hmm. you can see there's a tendency to want to impose uh, uniformity through the system. Localism is seen as something bad, which opposes mm -hmm. unity. But in the text, localism is part of unity, right? It's, it's and actually, part of diversity. Exactly. So, yeah, it's, well, it's so the, this the, is the, so interesting because, you know, the, the people who push diversity now are anti-hierarchical. And the problem is they sacrifice unity. And so the proposition in this text is that hierarchy is the structure that optimally balances the necessity of unity with the necessity uh, of diversity. And that in some ways so it all starts actually from, from the bottom, not, not the yeah. top. I mean, it's oriented towards the top. Mm -hmm. But we've seen this, I think we've talked in previous episodes, haven't we, that there's this kind of this gradual development from, you know, just a, a single individual to a couple, to a family, to a clan, to a tribe, and then all the way up to... Mm -hmm. A nation, and yet here we go right back to the building blocks, and mm -hmm. it's it's really, I mean, it's mm -hmm. profoundly countercultural. I mean, well, it is so unfashionable to talk about, <laughs> you know, tribalism well, is just just you know a, a byword for kind of primitivism, and we should really be thinking, you know, the Enlightenment vision is the brotherhood of man, mm -hmm. kind it, of the universal also, humanity. It's also countercultural to point out that hierarchy is the means by which peaceful diversity can be attained. Right, right. Yeah. right? Because yeah. if you fragment, so this the is notion would be if you fragment the hierarchy. Berks, platoons, yeah, these are exactly. just, that's where it's got to start and it builds up. Well, it's the up. same throughout the natu natural kingdoms, right? Because all, all animals, virtually all animals, even those that aren't social, are hierarchical. And there has to be a multiplicity of animals, but they have to organize themselves. And it's so fundamental, this is so fundamental. Something argument I've tried to make publicly is that your serotonergic system tracks your hierarchical position, and it's actually the system that sets up the architecture of your brain. Like, it's an unbelievably fundamental system, and one of the things it's primarily concerned with is hierarchical placement. And that's a reflection of the logos idea, the natural logos, that there's an ordering principle in nature itself to unite multiplicity and but unity, and that's saying? hierarchy. Hierarchy is also forms of tyranny, dictatorship, imperial empires, and but so that's on. A, that's, that's, we're but saying the opposite, no, that hierarchy say, tends how, to be authoritarian. How do you distinguish the two? I think... Well, this I, is covenantal, well, clearly. I, okay, well, that, well, that's how you distinguish it. So, so and, and I would say to some degree that, like, we, the, the radical leftist claim is that all hierarchies are expression of power. And I would say, no, no, all corrupt hierarchies are expression of power. A, a genuine hierarchy... And this would be a hierarchy that wouldn't be predicated on an ideology. It would be predicated on something like a valid covenant. Um, a valid hierarchy serves the proper vertical and horizontal purpose. So it serves the, the purposes of propagating social organization. You see this in chimpanzee hierarchies and in hierarchies of rats. But in human beings, it also serves that vertical axis that's the true uniting principle of the psyche and the social group at the same time. Yes. Exactly right, and this is why in, in the Bible, when it describes kingship, for example, it's not an absolute monarchy, it's, a, it's effectively a constitutional monarchy, right? One of, the, one of the commandments in the Bible is that the king, every, everybody is bound to write a Torah. Uh, you actually have to personally write a Torah, uh, or at least you have to write a letter in a Torah is the modern practice. If you're, if you're wealthy enough, you can commission the writing of a Torah. But the king is supposed to write two, right? He's supposed to write one that he carries, and he's supposed to carry it around on his person at all times in, in the Bible. And he's bound by the dictates of the Torah, which is why when you get to later books of, of the Bible, you end up having prophets who are coming and chiding the king. Where do you have well, it? Yeah. So so monarchy is, yeah. is a modern question. It's like, right. it's an image of... The, of and a, a very even, primitive question, right? It goes all the way back to Mesopotamia, and it goes all the way forward to the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, well, right. And so what, what we have here, we have the dawning of the question of by what standards should a monarch be bound? And one answer would be, well, only by the dictates of his own power. But 
obviously the prophets in the Old Testament object to that continually because they remind the kings constantly. Samuel, it's like, don't forget you're, you're, <laughs> you're, you're, you're properly subordinate to something, to the, to the principle of divine sovereignty itself. Exactly. And, and That's right. We, the Hebrew kings had no legislative power. Hmm. It's purely negative powers that they're told, isn't it? They, 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 they have sort of the necessary and proper clause of the Bible, right, which is like to, to achieve X purpose, you have the power to, to, you know, do what's necessary to achieve that. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it's a system where the king can be deposed. I mean, Saul is crowned the king by Samuel, and then Samuel comes back and he says, you've lost the kingship, it has been torn away from you. And so, it's given to this other guy. But I, for one, I'm very leery of hierarchical power. <laughs> Because I think that it I, is so often tyranny. Right. You know, well, it's even your left wingers who are suspicious of it. They talk diversity, end up with uniformity. Mm -hmm. They talk freedom and end up with tyranny. And well, it's no doubt that, that one of the, we, we've already established this to some degree, is imagine that there's a meet and proper hierarchical organization, but there's two internal enemies of, eternal enemies of that. And one would be the proclivity of it to degenerate into an, a false unity that's yeah. tyranny, and the other would be for it to fall into the clutches of chaotic nature. And you see that in, in, in religious battles symbolically throughout history, is that you can be battling, let's say, with the forces of the tyrannical giant, or you can be battling with the forces of the devouring dragon of chaos, which is generally given a feminine cast, the eternal enemies of proper order. And, and then you might ask too, like, Modern people who might object to tyranny, let's say sort of axiomatically, would say, they have to say of the tyrant that he's contravening the proper authority. That's what makes him a ty tyrant. And then you might push them and say, well, then what's the proper authority? And they might say the will of the people. But then you, the problem with that is you can get a degenerate populism. And so unless you have the notion of the will of the people, which would be that horizontal axis, aligned with the proper strictures of what, like a benevolent tradition, it's something like that, which would be the community extending into the past, you can't, and you, you can't hypothesize anything about the order that the tyrant is contravening. And then if you do object to tyranny, you're making the implicit assumption that there is a divine authority that the tyrant is contravening, right? So there's an implicit theism. It seems to me there's an implicit theism in That's the objection right. to tyranny. Biblical hierarchy is God. That's it. Sorry. I mean, we people don't like to hear that, but that is the ultimate Absolutely. freedom. And it's is when people God. believe that God is the source. That is why the, the American Declaration of Independence says that our rights come from the Creator. Mm -hmm. If they don't come from the Creator, mm -hmm. they come from human beings. If they come from human beings, we're screwed. And, and, and it, it, that's so critical, we, we don't like to say it because people like the Islamic regime of, of Iran have, have so distorted the notion of God as the head of state, as, as so, so to speak. But that, that's, that is what well, is ultimately, and, well, then, and then through the parent, as I, I mentioned in, in, in Honor Your Parents, and, but as you know, it's a, there's a beautiful verse in, in Exodus, uh, a man shall fear his mother and father, but keep my Sabbaths. So what the rabbis asked, why, why is, what's the juxtaposition? It sounds like a non sequitur. Yes, you, you, God, you should, your parents are your authority, but if they tell you to violate my law, my law comes first. Mm -hmm. God, parents, they to, you. They have to be subsidiary representatives By the way, and just God. one other point on, on, on this, the crowd that says no hierarchy, and they're, they're mm -hmm. only against the God hierarchy and the parental hierarchy and, the, and, and, and perhaps your rabbi or priest or minister's hierarchy. The Prime Minister of New Zealand said, I play this on my radio show regularly, if you do not hear it from the government, it is not true. Mm -hmm. If that is not tyranny, tyranny doesn't exist. So one thing we, could, we, we might turn to for a second is, so imagine that we have this idea of a distributed hierarchy that's not a tyrannical hierarchy because it's, 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 it's yeah, it's a subsidiary to subsidiary. the proper unity. That's right. Then you might say, well, what's the proper unity? And this is, this is partly what the biblical corpus is actually an examination of this. So we're made in the image of God. And what does that mean? Well, in, in Genesis, it means God is that which extracts habitable order out of the, the potential of chaos. It's something like that. And so 
And that is a principle. That's what we do in our life when we're learning and when we're on the edge and when we're in the zone of proximal development and when we're in dialogue is we're doing exactly that. We're confronting chaotic potential and transforming it into the habitable order that is good. And that's not something arbitrary, right? It's something, it's a, it's a very tight balance. That's what you're doing when you're dancing with someone. That's what you're doing when you're playing. And so the idea that, the, that what's at the pinnacle of the proper hierarchy isn't something arbitrary. It's, 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 it's the process by which the entire proper order is initially established and maintained. And it's real. It's, it's part of the spirit of proper communal organization, but it's also part of the spirit that unites us properly in gratitude with the well, generative traditions of the past. And because people, the relativists, they say, well, you, you know, you just put something arbitrary in the highest place. And so your tyranny, your religious tyranny is no more different than any, it's no... It's no different than any other arbitrary tyranny. It's like, no, that's not true. It's the principle that's at the top. There is a principle that needs to be at the top for the whole game to proceed. But Just boy, like, do, you, well, do you need safeguards? In other words, say servant leadership is a one safeguard. Right. You need a whole right, series. Right, well, that would because be Because in a postmodern age, power is the currency. Mm -hmm. Hierarchy tends to be very dangerous. Well, part, part of the insistence in the biblical corpus is that the, what did you call it, the servant? Servant leadership. Servant leadership, right. The Servant highest should Moses. serve the lowest. Mm -hmm. that's, that's presented in the biblical corpus as isomorphic with the spirit that confronts chaos and transforms it into habitable order. It just says they're expressions of the same underlying unity. And also, we could say the un that unity that manifests itself fractally is the spirit of adventure that calls to Abraham it's the spirit of careful, cautious uh, apprehension of the future that calls to Noah, and it's the spirit that leads the Israelites out of tyranny. It's all the same thing. And it's all an attempt to specify what that, what that necessary unity is that I, produces the proper hierarchy. I, I think there might be something else going on, and we're seeing in chapter 11 something very interesting, the kind of the slow dispersal of power from Moses to the 70 and then beyond. So we're getting to the point where, as it were, every individual within the, as it were, the hierarchy of the, the, the sort of political culture of, and structure of, of Israel has a kind of a, equal access to the divine, equal mm -hmm. access to the sacred. So. Mm -hmm. There is a hierarchy, but it's a kind of imminent hierarchy, and the principle that, that God right, was right at the top of the hierarchy, mm -hmm. mediated through Moses, is now that principle is starting to transcend mm -hmm. every every layer, every level mm -hmm. of, of the Israelites. Well, it's starting to break them down, by the way, right? Yeah. Because what's, what's going to happen in the rest of, of this book is that the people are going to start experimenting with ideas of how the hierarchical power ought to be distributed, yeah. right? So in the aftermath of the, the sin of the spies, when it becomes clear that everybody's going to die in the desert. You, you have, which we'll, I'm, I'm sure, get to, the story of Korah, which is who, who decides on essentially egalitarian politics, right? We, all of us have equal access to God. We don't need any hierarchy. The hierarchy is, is of no use to us. We have all equal, and that, that fails utterly mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a really delicate thing. I mean, what, what yeah. you're pointing mm -hmm. out, Oz, that, that it is delicate is, mm -hmm. is something that's important to remember. It's it, it, it's something that has to be consistently cultivated and maintained a proper hierarchy. Mm -hmm. It's not mm -hmm. as though it just continues to stand. Yeah. Like well, that's what religious practice is for, th is to maintain that. And that's indeed, the word hierarchy is a deeply religious yeah. word because, uh, I mean, I say this to please Jonathan, among other, <laughs> uh, for, among other reasons, but uh, I mean, I think I'm right in saying that the, the word hierarchy is coined by Dennis yeah. the Areopagite, pseudo-Dennis, um, and, of course, etymologically, it's linked to the ache, the source or the principle, uh, and the holiness of that, of that principle. So mm -hmm. we may have been lulled into this idea of, you know, of hierarchy in terms of you know, brute force, mm -hmm. but there's maybe a deeper sense of uh, hierarchy, which is linked to this idea which we've come across repeatedly in our reading, that of the sacred, that of the holy, and, and the importance of... So it's of the differentiation of the sacred, that's... The proper hierarchy is the oh. different. Well, that's well, what I'm I, I mean, obviously, one has to be careful about, about you, you know, uh, inferences from etymologies, but I, I just think it's worth noting that, mm -hmm. that it does have this sacral 
uh, religious. Yeah. Well, cause, uh, cause then well we should also notice that sacrum is also the base of the spine and it's what you rest <laughs> on, right? So if I we're talking a, about etymology. A quick so. plot question here about Moses' demotion. Do you think that, the, A, is this inevitable? Is this a result of the people complaining to him? Is it a result of him complaining to God? It's, it's pretty obviously him complaining to God. I mean, he yeah. goes to God and he asks for the demotion. Mm -hmm. And then the next thing that actually happens is yeah. you, you have the so whole situation. But it's it not himself. the first time he's yeah. done this. But if he, he did this at the beginning, with, and God yeah. gave him Aaron. And so it's like it's just a continuation of this pattern. So where could he have done something different to not get the demotion to not start the process of I mean, the, the, so theoretically, he, I mean, it, the, the counterfactual seems to be that, that Moses could have just gone to God and said, the people want meat. And God says, okay, well, then they're going to get as much meat as they, they possibly want. But Moses is, is really, at this point, angry with the people that he is. And remember, this is a person who, who gave up his possibility of being the nation, right? God said to him, you can be the nation. No, I'm sticking with these guys. And here are these guys just being the worst. And so he so says... So he's being driven crazy by their ingratitude. This is That's correct. why they keep coming but back. His no, it can but his drive you crazy well, ingratitude. And, and by the way, and if you see that because <laughs> he later, like, just a few paragraphs after this, what's going to happen is that there are a couple of other guys, and it's this really bizarre segment that seems completely unassociated with, with the plot line, where there are these two guys who are prophesying in the camp, right, Eldad and Medad, they show up and they're prophesying in the camp, and Joshua comes to Moses, he says, you should kill them. They're prophesying in the camp. You're the prophet. Why aren't you, why aren't you the one who's prophesying in the camp? And Moses says, what, if God chooses Eldad and Medad to talk to, then that's, that's his problem. Like, that, that's something that, that he gets to do. Moses is, is tired of being held solely accountable mm -hmm. so, for so the sins of people. So why do you presume that, that he's being demoted rather than being rewarded by mm -hmm. the differentiation of responsibility? I think it's the same thing in, oh. in, the, in the narrative, meaning like he, he asks for the demotion, but it's precisely that that makes everything unworkable. This is actually one of the, so the, there's a lot of talk sort of in the commentaries in, in, the, the por, in the portion of Jethro in Exodus, when, when Jethro comes to him and he says you should devolve authority down mm -hmm. the line, mm -hmm. there's actually a very, very hotly fought kind of what we call machloket, an argument over whether this is a good idea or a very bad idea. Meaning, like, it's a good idea in the sense that it makes things more workable for Moses, but it's a bad idea in the sense that Moses is the one with direct access to the divine who's going to make all the right decisions, right? The minute that you start to evolve authority, one of the problems is the people you devolve authority to can make some really bad decisions. Right. But it's but then you can raise them up. It's a right. So it's the problem of mediation in general. This is what I was trying to bring up right at the outset. It's like, the, in Aaron, if you look at it at the seed of Aaron, the, the Aaron will show you the problem of mediation. So there's a grumbling. It's like, no, 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 you know, we want some mediation. So God says, relents and says, fine, you have Aaron. Aaron is the one who makes the tabernacle. Aaron is the one who makes the golden calf. It's like those mm -hmm. are the two possibilities. Any mm -hmm. type of mediation is always subject to corruption because it's mm -hmm. a mediation. Right, right, and so right. in this text, we're seeing the same thing happen in different ways, which is, they say they want meat, like there's a relenting of God. And then later in, in the story, in the whole story, the, the Israelites say they want a king. All right, you have a king. Yeah, it's like, yeah. well, it's a relenting. And so, and that relenting has a positive and a negative yeah. aspect, just like all mediation. God can is still always achieve positive his purposes through the kind of concessions yeah, you can say that, that he makes Cosmically, he will human... ultimately achieve through that mediation. Right. It may even be the way that God processes through the world. Also, the, the kind of giant overarching message is, it doesn't matter what system you guys choose, whether it's a king or a set of judges. Or uh, The question is, how are you orienting yourself to the divine? Mm -hmm. If you properly orient yourself to the divine, then the system that you choose is almost of no consequence, which, by the way, is mm -hmm. kind of what Aristotle says, right? I mean, the, the, the basics, he says, like, any of these systems could theoretically work. Mm -hmm. The question is, which one is most likely to work? I think it's also important to say that, yeah. that it, it's, it's easy to think about hierarchy as if it's this kind of, you know, stacked things, because in a certain sense, that is what it, that, that is what it is. But as if you could live without it. But there is no living without hierarchy. I mean, think about, about it in the simplest terms. For example, where do you learn the things that you learn? Let's say, where did you learn to love another human being? Or where did you learn a certain virtue? And it always comes down to that having been mediated to, for you by someone else or some other situation, whether it's a teacher, a friend, a parent, or whatever. And so it seems to me that, that even if you regard things as completely flat, your progress through time is still always yes. being mediated. Well, okay, your, so your, your discoveries, for example. Well, then let's use that to move back to the text because that, that notion of your journeying through time being mediated by hierarchy is part of the remainder of this particular text. So remember, 14 to 27, order of the tribes. 
In the first place went the standard of the camp of the children of Judah, according to their armies, armies and over his host was Nashon, the son of Amminadab. Then we skip to 28. Thus were the journeyings of the children of Israel, according to their armies. Jonathan pointed out the text we skipped over, talked about the hierarchical organization of the phalanx moving forward. And Moses said unto Hobab, the son of Raguel, the Midianite, Moses' father-in-law, we are journeying unto the place of which the Lord said, I will give it to you, the promised land. Come thou with us, and we will do thee good. For the Lord hath spoken good concerning Israel. And he said unto him, I will not go, but I will depart to mine own land and to my kindred. And he said, Leave us not, I pray thee, for as much as thou knowest how we are to encamp in the wilderness, and thou mayest be to us instead of, of eyes. And it shall be, if thou go with us, Yea, it shall be that what goodness the Lord shall do unto us, the same will we will do unto thee. And they departed from the mount of the Lord three days' journey, and the ark of the covenant of the Lord went before them in the three days' journey to search out a resting place for them. And the cloud of the Lord was upon them by the day when they went out of the camp. And it came to pass when the ark set forward that Moses said, Rise up, Lord, and let thine enemies be scattered, and let them that hate thee flee before thee. And it went rested, and when it rested, he said, Return, O Lord, unto the many thousands of Israel. All right, so that's Numbers 10. I love that last, just the last few verses. We, we actually yep. say that quite a bit, like in Vesper services in the Orthodox Church, the, the uh, rise, O Lord, and let your enemies be scattered. And, it, and you can see the difference between the two. So it's like God comes up mm -hmm. and then everything is scattered. Mm -hmm. And then when Forward. it comes down, then it's like a gathering in of the... So God mm -hmm. returns and it's a gathering in of the people. So mm -hmm. it's like this beautiful image of, you know, of, the, of, of let's say, what it means to, to move out into the future, mm -hmm. but what it also means to have a home and to, to, to be Well, it is that when you're moving forward towards the promised land, when you're moving forward toward a destination, that you're, the obstacles scatter before you. Right? That's really what you're trying to do. Is you're, you're trying to move forward in a manner that makes the obstacles scatter. And as you said, you need to return to recollect yourself well, I and think to it rest also and, reinforces, because I'm a big believer in repeating a point, lest people forget it, that God is the ultimate uh, issue and the ultimate hierarchy. Let your enemies be scattered. It doesn't say let our enemies be scattered. Hmm. It's important. Right, so let's go to 11. Numbers 11, and when the people complained, it displeased the Lord, and the Lord heard it, and his anger was kindled, and the fire of the Lord burnt among them and consumed them that were in the uttermost parts of the camp. And the people cried unto Moses, and when Moses prayed unto the Lord, the fire was quenched, and he called the name of the place Taberah, because the fire of the Lord burnt among them. And the mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting. And the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? We remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely, the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. But our soul is dried away. There is nothing at all beside this manna before our eyes. And the manna was as coriander seed and the color thereof, the color of bdellium. And the people went about and gathered it and ground it in mills or beat it in a mortar or baked it in pans and made cakes of it. And the taste of it was as the taste of fresh oil. So they don't even notice they have heavenly food and they're complaining about not being, not right. being able to that's eat what they had under really the tyrant. The yeah, that's really yeah. the point. Yeah. And when the dew fell upon the camp in the night, the manna fell upon it. Then Moses heard the people weep throughout their families, every man in the door of his tent, and the anger of the Lord was kindled greatly. Moses also was displeased. And Moses said unto the Lord, Wherefore hast thou afflicted thy servant? And wherefore have I not found favor in thy sight, that thou layest the burden of all this people upon me? Have I conceived all this people? Have I begotten them, that thou shouldest say unto me, Carry them in thy bosom, as a nursing father beareth the sucking child unto the land which thou swearest unto their fathers? Whence should I have flesh to give unto all this people? For they weep unto me, saying, Give us flesh that we may eat. I am not able to bear all this people alone, because it is too heavy for me. 
And if thou deal thus with me, kill me, I pray thee, out of hand, if I have found favor in thy sight, and let me not see my wretchedness. And the Lord said unto Moses, Gather unto me seventy men of the elders of Israel, whom thou knowest to be the elders of the people, and officers over them, and bring them unto the tabernacle of the congregation, that they may stand there with thee. And I will come down and talk with thee there, and I will take of the Spirit which is upon thee, and I will put it on them, and they shall bear the burden of the people with thee, that thou bear it not thyself alone. And say thou unto the people, Sanctify yourself against tomorrow, and ye shall eat flesh. For you have wept in the ears of the Lord, saying, Who shall give us flesh to eat? For it was well with us in Egypt. Therefore the Lord will give you flesh, and ye shall eat. You shall not eat one day, nor two days, nor five, or ten, nor twenty, but even a whole month until it come out at your nostrils, and it be loathsome unto you, because that you have despised the Lord which is among you. That's part of the rejection of the manna, right? And you have wept before him, saying, Why came we forth out of Egypt? And Moses said, <laughs> The people among whom I am are six hundred thousand footmen, and thou hast said, I will give them flesh, that they may eat a whole month. Shall the flocks and the herds be slain for them to suffice them? Or shall all the fish of the sea be gathered together for them to suffice them? And the Lord said unto Moses, Is the Lord's hand waxed short? Thou shalt now see whether my word shall come to pass unto thee or not. And Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord, and gathered the seventy men of the elders of the people, and set them round about the tabernacle. And the Lord came down in a cloud and spake unto him and took of the spirit that was upon him and gave it unto the seventy elders. And it came to pass that when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied and did not cease. But there remained two of the men in the camp. The name of the one was Eldad and the name of the other Medad. And the spirit rested upon them. And they were of them that were written but went not out into the tabernacle, and they prophesied in the camp. And there ran a young man and told Moses and said, Eldad and Medad do prophesy in the camp. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of Moses, one of his young men answered and said, My Lord Moses, forbid them. And Moses said unto him, Envious thou for my sake? Would God that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. So he's actually happy that there's some devolution of the prophetic responsibility. And Moses got him into the camp, he and the elders of Israel. And there went forth a wind from the Lord and brought quails from the sea and let them fall by the camp, as it were a day's journey on this side and as it were a day's journey on the other side, round about the camp and as it were, two cubits high upon the face of the earth. It's like Quail City, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So is there also a, 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 an inference in the text here that, what is it? Is there an inference that if the, if the hierarchical order is properly devolved, then there will be plenty? And I'm asking this for a particular reason. You know, we, we have this notion now in, our, in the world that the, we have a zero-sum planet and that we're playing a zero-sum game, right? There's finite resources. And one of the things God is saying here, I think, is that if the people are organized properly, then the that the bounty of the earth is boundless and without end. Well, this is a but, punishment, right? So. I, would, would I, I, know, I know, I know, I know Then I think I that this text is very, very subtle. I think that what is being shown is both the positive and negative aspects of devolution at the same yeah, time. Right, right. And so God is showing, it's like, one of the aspects of this like flesh, like moving down into flesh is, oh, these people are prophesizing. They're not supposed, they're not in the hierarchy, but they're prophesizing. So this idea that like, the spirit of the Lord will fill the entire earth. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, the negative aspect is this, let's say, moving out into flesh and the fleshiness of that problem. So you kind of see these two things happening simultaneously, which mm -hmm. is kind of crazy. Mm -hmm. It's like you see these, like a punishment and a blessing at the same time, mm -hmm. but I think it has to do with the mystery of, of devolution or the mystery of mediation, uh, you know, how, it's, how that works. It's an, it's, it feels almost like it's an appropriate level of too muchness for them, the way that he put Moses in the rock and shielded him so that he couldn't see him in full. 
And it's almost an iteration of that. Like, you can't handle to see the full sight of me. And it's like, you want meat? It's down lower. Here's enough that it will overwhelm you. It'll come out mm -hmm. your nostrils. Yeah. Well, and there's, there's a lot here just in terms of what Moses wants, God gives to him also. And it turns out to be just a terrible decision. Mm. Right? Because as soon as this authority devolves, the thing that, that never happens in the desert before, which is Moses gives an order and the people just say, okay, now that the authority has been devolved, Moses starts giving orders and people are like, nope. This is and the things fall apart this is, super fast. It's the careful what you wish for section. Mm -hmm. right. Right. Yeah, that's right. exactly right. 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 Well, I think it's important right. to remember that <clears throat> I mean, it's easy to regard this narrative as, you know, kind of wilderness, sort of bad, promised land, good, as if, you know, you know it, it's all about sort of getting there. I think that's a really profound uh, uh, kind of mistake because I think what this, what the, what these, this revelation is giving us is a sense about the 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 interdynamic you might say between wilderness and promised land, and they're not they're not easily separable, right? You can be in a place of of, of plenty, right, and then you can you know, eat too much, and what, all of a sudden you find yourself in poverty, in a kind of spiritual poverty, right? You lose a sense of who you are. You ate too much. You sleep in. You lose everything else. And so, similarly, you know, the wilderness. The wilderness is a place that, that God provides water and revelation and, and the law and, and all of that. And so I think... And manna. And manna. And so I think really what is... And there's a certain sense in which if you're, if you're too much in, in a certain sense of place of satiety, well, what do you do? You take on a discipline of fasting because that discipline of fasting, of withdrawal, in fact, is what then clarifies your vision and makes you able to see again what you have forgotten. And so I think that there's a, there's a really... It's not clear to me that we ever are not or should even want, not in a deep sense, to be in a kind of wilderness. That is to say, the place where you can be receptive to the revelation. And so I think what really is here is, is it's about a kind of mediation, as Jonathan keeps saying, the relation between our, our, our state of, of a kind of spiritual longing and misdirection and ignorance and, and the discovery of what that, what that end really is, that is such that we can internalize or seek that end from within the, the, the time infinitude that is actually inescapable to us in this life, except in the sense that as you come to have that end revealed to you in that time and change, in a sense, you are transcending that as it is mediated yeah, to right. you. So then you get the advantages of the particular and the particular adventure with the union of the infinite. That We talked about that a little bit with regards to the idea of veiling, is that you're, you have the problem of the finite, you need a relationship with the infinite. It can't be a total relationship because that would destroy you. It has to be, it's a balance. Again, it has to be enough of a relationship to sustain you in the desert, and then that turns into something approximating the proper promised land. I mean, what, what, what you're talking about in terms of sort of the, the frailty of the wilderness, but that also being the, the place of repository of holiness, the, the festival of booths that we celebrate is specifically that, right? So that you're actually supposed to go out of your home and you build a fragile booth and you live in this fragile booth right. for seven days. Right. And it's supposed to be a place where you can, it, like the, the roof has to be built in such a way where, where the rain has to be able to come through, you have to be able to see the stars. It's supposed to be deliberately fragile because we spend our lives trying to insulate ourselves from the wilderness. But the reality is that life is the wilderness. And so the idea when you're in the sukkah is that the sukkah is a better reflection of what life actually is, this very fragile thing mm -hmm. in, an, in a transitory place. And that's why you have to keep your eyes you know, above you and that's why you have to be surrounded by ritual in order to allow you to navigate. There. It's also a, a, a reminder to be grateful for what you have, right? Because mm -hmm. I wonder if that's part of the reason why camping is such a, is such a, mm -hmm. a, a ritual in, in, say, North America, is that people will just abandon all that for some time and go back and live in a tent with a... And they say they're communing with nature, but I think part of it is also... It's great, it's gratitude for nature, but it's also a way of reestablishing gratitude for, mm -hmm. for, for the comfort that you left. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you camp for a week, that's enough, enough camping. And then you remember, you know, you remember what you have. And part of it, what does happen, as we already pointed out, as the Israelites are walking through the desert, is they forget and they, they falsify the past. And so that return is a, that re voluntary return is a way of remembering. So, mm. all yeah, right. And falling so, into the flesh is represented as forgetting. 
like everywhere in the church fathers. Like that's what it is mm -hmm. because it's not that flesh itself is, is bad, is that if you desire it and you kind of move into it, then you, that's what it is. You forget the source of it. You forget mm -hmm. what is the and origin. And that's the that. violation of that verticality, right. I would yeah. say. It seems like the ingratitude, am I, am I the only one who's reading Moses' discussion or complaints to God as, as also expressing that ingratitude? Elaborate. Well, I think he's complaining about their ingratitude. I'm on Moses' side here. <laughs> I'm as pissed at them as he is. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you have a counter case to me? Well, I just, I think that in the dialogue, you know, as he's talking, it sounds very, um, have I conceived these, all these people, right? You did this. Mm -hmm. Can't you handle this? Well, they this? keep saying to oh. each other, your people, my people, whatever mm -hmm. they're right. annoyed with them. So you right. see a, a hint. God, your right. Look what it's your daughter your people, did. You right. see, right. Do you see a hint of ingratitude <laughs> Yeah, it feels Moses? like the ingratitude emerges from the camp and sort of infects. He's human, and mm -hmm. he's exhausted, and he's getting older. Look, he's, Moses right, didn't right. want the job from the beginning. But he's, this is a, another problem of leadership. You don't want leaders who want to lead, and you don't want leaders who don't want to lead. Mm -hmm. There's no perfect answer. Ideally, you don't want ambitious, oh, I'm dying for power. But he, he didn't want it. He would have been very happy to remain a shepherd in, in Midian. So it, 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 there's, no, there's no ideal answer to this problem. Well, but, I, I but like the, Jonathan's insistence on the idea that this is a very paradoxical text, that you see what yeah. is positive and what is negative about the entire process being laid out simultaneously. And so... All right, so... By the way, on, 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 on just, you, you mentioned, uh, what was it, um, misremembering the past? Yep. What was the term yep. you used? That's or misrepresenting, the, misrepresenting the, past. the past. So I'll just tell you a great Soviet, um, the greatest humor I've ever known is Soviet dissident humor. Because, and, and I, I, you know, I spent a lot of time in the Soviet Union, and, and so I, this is my favorite humor. So here was a great line in the Soviet Union, and it was this, in the Soviet Union... The future is known. It's the past which is always changing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, right. All right, so we're knee deep in quails here. You're neck deep. And that, that's too much heavenly abundance, too. Or, or too much the earthly quails abundance. Are too much as something that rises right. up. The manna yeah. comes down and the, right. quail, the quails rise up. They're really right. seen as flesh. And, and yeah, you have we, to see that as two, like two things crossing each other. That right, way. two different kinds of food. Yeah. One rising from the mat material yeah. world and one descending from, from the, the spiritual heaven. world. Right. Now we have too much material. Luxury yeah. here, right? A surfite. It's from, from the sea. A planet. What's, what's the significance of that? It's, it's even, it's like it's the below. Yeah, it's from below. From, the, from, from below. Right. Yeah. I got it. Okay. And so the people stood up all that day and that night and the next day, and they gathered the quails. He that gathered least gathered ten homers, which is apparently a lot of quails, and they spread them all abroad for themselves around the camp. And while the flesh was yet between their teeth, ere it was chewed, the wrath of the Lord was kindled against the people. And the Lord smote the people with a very great plague. And he called the name of that place Kibroth Hattava, because they buried the people that lusted. And the journey, people journeyed from that place of lust, Kibroth Hattava, unto Hazaroth, and abode at Hazaroth. Mm. All right, we'll switch to Numbers 12. It's a very complicated, sophisticated text. I think it's so, and really I think that, that 12 and 11, I think 11 and 12 are meant to be parallel. parallel, like are meant to reflect each other for you to see both. Okay, so we'll let you, we'll let you sure, take sure. that yeah, on yeah. when we all go through 12 completely, because this part of it's actually, it's not that long. Uh, a strange little narrative interlude. And um, Miriam complains of Moses' Ethiopian wife. And Miriam and Aaron spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian. Oh, Ethiopian woman whom he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. And they said, Hath the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? Hath he not spoken also by us? And the Lord heard it. Now, the man Moses was very meek. This is an interlude, parenthetical interlude. Now the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. Interesting interlude because it suggests that the reason that God is speaking to Moses is because he's He's humble. He's, it's, it's the depth of his humility that makes him a prophet of God. Remarkable thing. And the Lord spake suddenly unto Moses and unto Aaron and unto Miriam. Come out, you three, unto the tabernacle of the congregation. That's not a good day. And they three came out. And the Lord came down in the pillar of the cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam. And they both came forth. And he said, Hear now my words. 
if there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision and will speak to him in a dream. My service, my servant Moses, is not so, who is faithful in all mine house. With him I will speak mouth to mouth, even apparently, and not in dark speeches. And the similitude of the Lord shall he behold. Wherefore then were ye not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? So Moses is such a good prophet that God speaks to him in words, and Moses knows the words. Doesn't use dreams, doesn't use visions. It's unmediated communication. Can I get elaboration so, on dark speeches? From riddles some? is usually right, the way it's right. translated. Parado yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. Do you know how dreams do yeah, that? Like they the dream of the pharaoh, dreaming of cows, you know. Right. It won't be vague. God, yeah, know. God speaks clearly to Moses. <laughs> yeah. Right, right, right. And so there's an, an implication there that if you're sufficiently meek, humble, that God's will will become known to you in a manner clear enough to transform it into speech itself. That's quite the proposition. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed. And the cloud departed from off the tabernacle. And behold, Miriam became leprous, white as snow. And Arian looked upon Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. And Aaron said unto Moses, Alas, my Lord, I beseech thee, lay not the sin upon us, wherein we have done foolishly, and wherein we have sinned. Let her not be as one dead, of whom the flesh is half consumed, when he come out of his mother's womb. And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, Heal her now, O God, I beseech thee. And the Lord said unto Moses, If her father had but spit in her face, should she not be ashamed seven days? Let her be shut out of the camp seven days, and after that let her be received in again. And Miriam was shut out from the camp seven days, and the people journeyed not till Miriam was brought in again. And afterward the people removed from Hazaroth and pitched in the wilderness of Paran. Jonathan, why don't you take up that story? Well, I think this is, I think in one sense what you've got is in the previous chapter you have something like a lusting for the, for the flesh, like a lusting for the for the, the lower parts of reality. And here what you have is an excess of purity where in some ways Miriam is complaining that Moses has a dark wife or a stranger wife. And, and, and so it, it is completely parallel to the other side. So on the one end, you have God getting angry because people want too much of what is below or what is outside or what is strange. And now in this sense, it's like it's a false purity. It's like a weird... Uh, it's a it's a pride a purity of pride you could say and so and then the punishment is a joke it's a funny joke and one of the few jokes in scripture where he makes her too white you could say because she's complaining that Moses has a darker wife and so it's like it's the I think these are, these two go together because they show us the two possible excesses that you can have one is too much purity one is too much uh, let's say chaos or, or too much moving out into the outside. And so if you read only one, you get one, one picture, but if you see both of them reflected together, you get a general sense of, of what balance looks like. It's also a preamble for the big rebellion because Korach's argument is, aren't we all holy? And that's exactly what Miriam and Aaron are saying. He's holier than us. Mm -hmm, right, so, right. And God is saying, yes, yes. he is. That's what yeah, God right. Is. That's <laughs> right. Which is and so her punishment then. is to be falsely elevated yes. as pathologically whole. That's By right, the way, it shows like you that. as well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I'm, I'm a big fan of Moses. Uh, so I just want, <laughs> I, I, I am. I, I want to defend him as well. Again, because I just want to note how lonely the man must have been. Mm -hmm. First of all, leaders in general are lonely, I mean, and clergy are lonely. I very, I speak to clergy a lot, and it's hard for a priest, minister, or rabbi to have very close friends in their congregation. And 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 this is writ large. But aside from that, look, his brother and, and his sister are are doing this against him. Mm -hmm. And uh, who does he have? I just want, on a human level, I just wanted to note mm -hmm. that for on Moses' behalf. And, you know, the, added to that is that line that you talked about, Jordan, the, the, the side note, how humble he is. Yeah. So, you know, I think that people often misinterpret what, what humility is, which is yeah. this, this sort of mistaking of who you are, where, oh, well, you know, I'm not that good at this right. thing. We all right. know that's false humility. Well, what true humility is is understanding that 
your qualities are not really your own, right? They're, they're gifts that have been given to you by something above. And that's really what Moses understands about himself, is that this is not something that is self-generated by me. This is like a duty that came on me and it came with certain qualities. And so I understand myself really well, which the is why- The leadership isn't his. Correct. And so, when, and, and so that also sort of explains why the most humble people are the ones who are going to receive the prophecy. Because yeah. otherwise, when God speaks to them, it's going to be misinterpreted and mediated through the prism of the ego, yeah. right? As yeah. soon as as yeah. soon as soon you say that these are my qualities, then everything God says gets reinterpreted through your own That's idea of yourself. That's part of using the Lord's name in vain. And so for, for Moses, he, he doesn't, and so he also has no answer to them. So they say to him, essentially, that there's a whole argument in the Talmud about like what exactly the critique here is. Uh, one of the critiques is, why are you marrying outside the tribe? Everybody else marries inside the tribes. Yeah. Why are you marrying outside the tribe? You're the, you're the leader of the tribe, so what's the deal with that? Shouldn't you have known that? But and Moses- she understood as Jethro's daughter? Or no, it's not the same wife. No, no it's, it's probably a, a second wife. Yeah. Right. And not so, definitely, but probably. And so even if it were Jethro's wife, it would still be outside yeah. the tribe because again, he was a Midianite, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so the, the, there, there's that read. There's also a read that suggests that, that the actual critique that, that, mo that he's getting is that there's an, you're, you're ordered to, to have children. And so one of the things that, that is sort of suggested by the level of Moses' holiness is that he's no longer actually propagating children with his wife. He's not sleeping with his wife, essentially. And so Miriam is very upset about that. She says, why, don't, why, aren't, you, why aren't you doing that? Which would be an echo of actually you know, earlier in Exodus, right? She says this, according to Rashi, according to one of the commentators, she said this to her own parents, that the parents in, in Exodus had stopped having children because they were afraid they're going to get thrown in the river. And so she said to them, no, you have to go do that. In any case, the, the critique, Moses is humble enough to actually hear the critique. And so it's up to God to say, you don't understand. <laughs> like you guys are not on the same level that Moses is. But again, it goes back to that idea that once, once the authority is perceived to have devolved, what, mm -hmm. the way that God sees it is, I'm taking some of my authority and I'm putting it on other people, but you didn't lose your authority, right? It didn't, it didn't really diminish your standing vis-a-vis -vis them, but everybody else perceives that because they have risen, Moses has therefore fallen, and therefore they are allowed to challenge Moses for the leadership, even if they're doing it unconsciously, because Aaron and Moses don't actually want to overthrow, Aaron and, and Miriam don't want to overthrow their brother. It, it's more like, well, now we're on the same level, right? We're all on the same level, and God's like, no, you are absolutely not on the same level. Well, Man, Oz, too, there's a, there's a reference there, too, to like Moses is being elevated in this text because God insists that he's his favorite in, in some fundamental way. That is, but, but, but the text insists that the reason that Moses is God's favorite is because he adopts, a, in, a, in a way, a lowly stance. Mm -hmm. right? So there's this notion that what's the highest sovereign good isn't prideful and powerful in, in the way that you would conceptualize that sort of psychopathically. But so. the text here about the prophecy is very interesting. Right, so the, the fact that it's, it's emphasized that, um, uh, Pache Jonathan, that uh, it's not, <laughs> you know, he's not using enigmatic, symbolic, uh, ecstatic. Yeah. Uh, I mean, this is language. Yeah. I mean, this is almost, you wonder whether this is a, uh, a sort of critique of the certain kind of danger that a prophet can represent. Well, you know, Freud believed that we, we censored our dream content, you know, and we, and we did that really because of ego-like manipulation. We didn't want to hear what the dream had to say, and it sort of it put a twist into, you could think about it as putting a twist into the revelation. And you might say that the more, the more impure the prophetic voice, the more the, the revelation of, the, of God has to be veiled and hidden and devious. And so you have this implication in Moses that there's none of that happening, and so it just happens in speech. So Moses is capable of divinely inspired speech and not having to God is much less veiled to him as a consequence. But it's not even like mouth to ear. He says mouth to mouth. Right, as if right. like direct. When he speaks, I'm speaking right, to him. That's right. By the way, it's the same right. language that's used when Moses, when Moses dies at the end of Deuteronomy. Mm -hmm. Right? So right. The, the, that relationship is so close. And that's also why Moses has to be the conduit, right? The, the, later in Deuteronomy, and one of the best passages of the, the whole Bible, uh, is, is the section where he says that it's not in heaven, right? It's here on earth for you to understand. It's not in heaven. Lo bashamayim he. Right? That's... That makes sense to Moses, right? It's very difficult because God's law is really esoteric and it's difficult to understand a lot of this stuff from the outside perspective. But from Moses' perspective, it's not difficult at all. He has perfect clarity seeing all of this stuff. And so he says, it's not in heaven, right? It's for you. Like you should, you should grasp it and you should grab it and you should grab a hold of it. 
And that's why Moses is so passionate, because his passion for God also extends to his passion for the law, which he then tries to pass along to the people. For the Christians here, my Christian uh, friends frequently note the sin of pride. That is a, it's a big sin in, in, in Christendom, if, if I'm not mistaken. So does this verse in any way bug you that he was the humblest man on the face of the earth? You mean because it... Be, Doesn't why? it, does that suggest, I mean, how many people, if you heard someone say to you, I am the humblest man on earth, well, it's not a, he's not, well, I guess you're right, well, he's supposedly you writing Moses the text. That's, that's called a humble a, brag. These yeah, are right. the because he's supposedly the Moses. author. Right, I, that's I, why. No, 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 yeah, the, yeah. We're, the we're, traditional we're, we're Christian assuming, We're assuming Jude. it's God's judgment. Okay, but the, tra the traditional... No, 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 so, no, no, is that, is that the way? I know, so I, never, so it, I never thought of it that way. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah no, it is a very interesting way to think about it. Because the 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 traditional Jew and Christian believe that the, God dictated this, as it were, to Moses. So when Moses hears, let's say that happened. So Moses hears, I want you to write that you're the humblest man on the face of the earth. <laughs> and so does Moses go, well, I'll tell you the truth, I, I, God, I, I feel a little awkward write, <laughs> writing that line. I mean, isn't that a fair question? It's, it's, a, com it's a comical it's question. A comical it's question. a comical question. It's a comical question. question. I'm going to move past the comedy, into the spies of Canaan here, um, and, and read 13 and 14, I think. And so, and this is the part of the story where, while we're moving towards the promised land, and we can, we have a reconnoiter, and the news isn't good. It's going to be more difficult than, more difficult and perhaps less promised than we'd hoped in some way. 13.1, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Send thou men, that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel. Of every tribe of their fathers shall ye send a man, a man, every one, a ruler among them, scouts. And Moses, by the commandment of the Lord, sent them from the wilderness of Paran. All these men were heads of the children of Israel. And then we name all the heads of the tribe, so we know who the scouts are. These are the names of the men which Moses sent to spy out the land. And Moses called Oshia, the son of Nun, Yehoshua. And Moses sent them out to spy out the land of Canaan and said unto them, Get up you this way southward and go up into the mountain and see the land and what it is and the people that dwelleth therein and whether they be strong or weak or few or many and what the land is that they dwell in, whether it be good or bad and what cities they be that they dwell in, whether in tents or in strongholds, and what the land is, whether it be fat or lean, whether there be wood therein or not, and be of good courage, and bring of the fruit of the land. And the time was the time of the first ripe grapes. So they went up and searched the land from the wilderness of Zin unto Rehob, as men come to Hamath. And they ascended by the south and came unto Hebron, where Ahaman, Sheshai, and Talmai, the children of Anak, were. And they came unto the brook of Eshcol, and cut down from thence a branch with one cluster of grapes, and they bare it between two upon a staff, and they brought of the pomegranates and of the figs. The place was called the brook Eshcol because of the cluster of grapes which the children cut down from hence, from thence. And they returned from searching of the land after forty days. And they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel, unto the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh, and brought back word unto them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him and said, We came unto the land whither thou sentest, and surely it does flow with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites, and the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up all the inhabitants thereof, 
and all the people that we saw in it are men of a great stature. And we saw giants, the son of Anak, which come of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. And I'll go to 14. I might as well finish this part of the story. 14.1, and the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. And the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, and the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God had we died in the wilderness? And wherefore hath the Lord brought us unto this land to fall by the sword that our wives and children should be a prey? Were it not better for us to return unto Egypt? And they said one to another, Let us make a captain and return to Egypt. And Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. And Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes. And they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land, the land which we passed through to search it, it is an exceeding good land. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which floweth with milk and honey. Only... Rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bread for us. Their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. But all the congregation bade, stone them with stones. And the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before all the children of Israel. And the Lord said unto Moses, How long will this people provoke me? And how long will it be ere they believe me? for all the signs which I have showed among them. I will smite them with the pestilence and disinherit them and will make of thee, once again, a greater nation and mightier than they. And Moses said, the Egyptians, they'll hear about this, for thou brought us up thy people in thy might from among them, and they will tell it to the inhabitants of this land, for they have heard that thou, Lord, art among this people, that thou, Lord, art seen face to face, and that thy cloud standeth over them, and that thou goest before them by daytime in a pillar of cloud, and in a pillar of fire by night. Now, if thou shalt kill all these people as one man, then the nations which have heard the fame of thee will speak, saying, because the Lord was not able to bring this people into the land which he sware unto them, therefore he hath slain them in the wilderness. And now I beseech thee, let the power of my Lord be great, according as thou hast spoken, saying, The Lord is long-suffering and of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, and by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation. Pardon, I beseech thee, the iniquity of this people, according unto the greatness of thy mercy. mercy. And as thou hast forgiven this people from Egypt even until now, and the Lord said, I have pardoned according to thy word. But truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Because all these men which have seen my glory and my miracles, which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and have tempted me now these ten times, and have not hearkened to my voice, surely they shall not see the land which I swore upon, to their, which I swore upon their fathers. Neither shall any of them that provoked me see it, but my servant Caleb, because he had another spirit with him and hath followed me fully, him will I bring into the land whereinto he went, and his seed shall possess it. Now, parentheses, now the Amalekites and the Canaanites dwelt in the valley. Tomorrow turn you and get you into the wilderness by way of the Red Sea. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, saying, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation which murmur against me? I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel, which they murmur against me. Say unto them, As truly as I live, saith the Lord, as ye have spoken in mine ears, so will I do to you. Your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness, and all that were numbered of you, according to your whole number, from twenty years old and upward, which have murmured against me. Doubtless you shall not come into the land, concerning which I swear to make you dwell therein, save Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun. But your little ones, which you said shall be a prey, them will I bring in, and they shall know the land which you have despised. But as for you, 
your carcasses, they shall fall in this wilderness. And your children shall wander in the wilderness 40 years and bury your whoredoms until your carcasses be wasted in the wilderness. After the number of the days in which you search the land, even 40 days, each day for a year shall you bear your iniquities, even 40 years, and ye shall know my breach of promise. I, the Lord, have said, I will surely do it unto all this evil congregation that are gathered together against me. In this wilderness they shall be consumed, and there they shall die. And the men which Moses sent to search the land who returned and made all the congregation to murmur against him by bringing up a slander against the land, even those men that did, even those men that did bring up the evil report upon the land died by the plague before the Lord. But Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, which were of the men that went to search the land, lived still. And Moses told these sayings unto the children of Israel, and the people mourned greatly. And they rose up early in the morning and got them up into the top of the mountain, say, Lo, we be here, and we'll go up into the place which the Lord hath promised, for we have sinned. And Moses said, Wherefore now? do you transgress the commandment of the Lord, but it shall not prosper. Go not up, for the Lord is not among you, that you be not smitten before your enemies. For the Amalekites and the Canaanites are there before you, and you shall fall by the sword, because you were turned away from the Lord. Therefore the Lord will not be with you. But they presumed to go up to the hilltop. Nevertheless, the ark of the covenant of the Lord and Moses departed not out of the camp. Then the Amalekites came down, and the Canaanites which dwelt in that hill, and smote them, and discomfited them, even unto Hormah." Well, that brings us pretty much to the end of our two-hour time slot for today. And we have the breaking out of a tremendous discontent, right? The, we'll, we'll pick this up tomorrow at this point, that, well, there's scouts sent out to the Promised Land to check out its quality and the strength of its strongholds, and then there's another dichotomy of viewpoint. Some of the spies say, it's everything that we were promised, and others say, uh, this is going to be so difficult, we should just give up, and that causes a tremendous fraction once again among the Israelites, and the consequence of that is, is twofold. Well, first of all, God's going to just wipe them all out again, and <coughs> Moses intercedes the same way he has before, tells God he's breaking his word, and then God says, well, okay, I'll keep the covenant, but there's, there's going to be some hell to pay, and the covenant is reconstructed in some way now. It's not the people who are journeying through the desert that are going to get to the promised land. It's a couple of them, but at, it's going to be their children. And so now the time is extended, and, the, and the, the idea here is you lost faith, guys. You lost faith. You lost sight of the vision. As soon as there was a bit of obstacle, you departed from your union with the covenant and with the guiding spirit, you're now weak, your enemies can slay you. It's like, even so, I won't wipe you out completely, but you're not getting where you're going. And, you know, you can see that in your own life when you have a vision laid in front of you and you lose faith and you scatter your forces and maybe you don't attain the vision and maybe your children don't either. And so... Well, and so I guess that's probably a good place to stop today, gentlemen. Thank you to everyone watching and listening. Uh, as always, your time and attention is much appreciated. Thank you to the Daily Wire Plus crew for facilitating these conversations and continuing the, the journey from the ty tyranny through the desert into the Promised Land, which I suppose is the conclusion of the seminar for us, the successful conclusion. Thank you, gentlemen very much once again for your participation and okay. will and Ben oh yes Ben thank you for coming we're going to lose Mr. Shapiro tomorrow which is a great loss but we've been very pleased to have him here and you know, the Sabbath dictates so. precisely <laughs> precisely he's going to abide by the dictates of the covenant uh, unlike the rest of us heathens and uh, <laughs> and so we'll we'll move to episode 16 tomorrow bye for now